Well, welcome everybody to another HydroTerra webinar. Great to see so many people here today. Following up on our previous webinar on AI by Matthew O'Brien, we've brought in some real big guns around the potential for AI and the opportunities it can be used to transform catchment management. Got two presenters today. Professor David Hamilton, who's director of the Australian Rivers Institute at Griffith University, and Ajmal Mian, professor from the University of Western Australia. Before we start, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we conduct our work across this great land and for that privilege, we would like to thank the traditional owners. Hydroterra respectfully acknowledges the Boonwurrung people of the Kulin Nation, where we are located today, and we pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. There's a picture of our presenters today. A little bit about our presenters. So some of you will be familiar with David. He's done some really good presentations for us. Uh, in the past, and those recordings are available on our website under the webinars tab. But David Hamilton is the director and a professor in the Australian Rivers Institute at Griffith University. He has held positions in environmental engineering at the University of Western Australia and biological sciences at the University of Waikato in New Zealand. He was appointed as the inaugural Bay of Plenty Regional Council Chair in Lake Restoration at the University of Waikato in 2002 and held this position for 15 years until his current appointment. His research has involved testing and modelling of lake restoration actions and more generally documenting the restoration and recovery of freshwater ecosystems. In recent years, he has been closely involved in management and policy implementation for freshwater ecosystems, holding appointments with the Ministry for the Environment and advisory roles for regional councils and industry groups in New Zealand and Australia. He is editor-in-chief of the scientific journal Inland Waters and an associate editor of Hydrobiologia and Aquatic Ecology. Hajma Mian is a professor of computer science at UWA and is known for his research in artificial intelligence, computer vision, machine learning, and robotics. He is an Australian Research Council Future Fellow in 2022, Fellow of the International Association for Pattern Recognition, President of the Australian Pattern Recognition Society, ACM Distinguished Speaker, and served as senior editor for IEEE Transactions on Neural Networks and Learning Systems and associate editor for IEEE Transactions on Image Processing and the Pattern Recognition Journal. He has published over 300 scientific papers in high-ranked AI journals and conferences, and he is the recipient of three prestigious and competitive fellowships from the Australian Research Council. He has secured 13 major grants from the ARC and the National Health and Medical Research Council of Australia, and two major grants from DARPA USA. His research interests include artificial intelligence, 3D computer vision, machine learning, deep learning, 3D point cloud analysis, face recognition, human action recognition, and remote sensing. So we've got two true specialists here today from really quite different backgrounds who are looking to collaborate to do some magic in the area of catchment management. Before we get started, we love your questions. And to do that, you need to use the Q&A button at the top of your screen. If you type your questions in there, I will read those out once the presenters have finished. 
Why does Hydrotur do these webinars? We like to share knowledge. We like to facilitate education. And we like to help industry leaders. And certainly this is a, a good example of that. Without further ado, I'd like to hand over to our speakers. Over to you, David. Thank you, Richard. And um, can I also respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I am based here at Griffith University at Nathan, uh, the Turbal and Yagara people, and pay my respects to their elders past and, and present. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about for AI, AI opportunities to transform catchment management covers um, what has really been over the past year, um, putting together a team and the team is here. It consists of uh, 18 chief investigators and one um, principal investigator shown here. And so um, this team has uh, been brought together from quite broad disciplinary expertise, um, ranging from AI and machine learning through to catchment science, to um, traditional knowledge, and also to governance and, and management of, of systems. So I'll talk a little bit about that at the, at the end of the, the talk here, but um, just to, to let you know that it's really been put together um, as, as a result of this year-long collaboration and, and interaction, which involves not just these people, but um, for me especially and for others, a wide consultation that's been come about with various government agencies and industry. And so really what I'm going to do is summarise some of the learnings before handing over to Ajmal um, to talk more specifically about some of the AI opportunities. Uh, Next slide. So what I'm going to present in essence is a series of slides that summarise um, what feedback I've had from government and from industry over the past um, while. And one of these has undoubtedly been getting out of the data churn. Um, as we know, sensors, environmental sensors, the Internet of Things, remote sensing capability has increased pretty well exponentially. And if you think that there is a lot of information about now, um, it's only going to increase into the future. So how on earth do we, are we able to develop um, tools and strategies which enable us to sort of get out of the data churn? And that is the enormous effort that's required in processing data and using um, the resources and capability of these people um, directed just into processing and processing the data when in fact we want to know a lot about the data itself. We want to sit over the top of it and be able to more effectively uh, strategize. And as one of the people in our team has said, it's really a choice of this utopia um, where if we use some of the upcoming technologies effectively, freeing ourselves up to have that time to strategize, to overview projects versus the dystopia of sort of being buried in the, in the weeds of data. And just to give you some idea of how rapidly things are, are increasing in terms of the Internet of Things and um, the amount of data that's being collected, it's more than a, a, an order of magnitude increase between 2017 and 2025. So, um, it, you know, in just eight years, we're looking at a more than tenfold increase in the amount of information that's, that's coming in. Uh, next slide. And what's happened uh, with so much of this information becoming available has been that we're using just a mere fraction of the information that's actually being generated. So if you look at the case of, of satellite information, uh, we've got choices of, of obviously of multiple uh, satellites. We've got multiple Earth observation systems that are operating, whether that be LIDAR, whether that be um, satellites such as GRACE that can monitor groundwater levels at large scale, um, Landsat, Sentinel satellites, um, 
those are incredible opportunities for us. But at the moment, um, we're sort of buried in the weeds and, and not able to be able to transfer the knowledge and, and capability of those types of um, information sources effectively. So the ability to use automation and actually be able to generate near real-time information on the land and water systems that are of interest to us could be a, a real game changer. Um, and that means processing past information, being able to effectively use um, some of the emerging capability like Google Earth Engine uh, and put together disparate sources of information um, in a sort of harmonized fashion. Next slide. So um, we could say knowing what happened yesterday as well as some time ago. So if we are able to do this effectively using automated data assimilation opportunities, and just to make mention that the world of remote sensing is changing very quickly towards a much greater um, use of machine learning technology at the moment, then we're able to, to almost have this real-time information. It opens up a whole lot of emerging opportunities to see, for example, what's changed uh, overnight or perhaps over months, over a couple of months on the landscape. Um, another opportunity might be to consider water distributions on the landscape, to know whereabouts um, in this particular case, uh, farm dams have been filled uh, as, a, as a result of, um, for example, um, heavy rainfall. If we're able to combine, um, sorry, Richard. Sorry. Um, if we're able to combine those, the, some of those different sources like LIDAR and um, other remote sensing um, capabilities like Landsat, then we're able to actually establish numerical values for, in this case, the amount of water that's held um, in some of those dams. So it provides us with a, a real opportunity to be able to manage and potentially to regulate um, and to feed information back to, to landholders um, on what is relevant to them. Next slide. The opportunity that I'm very interested in is being able to apply some of the, the highly spatially and temporally resolved models. So these are things like hydrological models, hydrodynamic models, and coupled hydrodynamic and water quality models as, as examples. So they're highly resolved in space, they're highly resolved in time, um, and they have, they're very intensive in terms of their numerical requirements. And those numerical requirements might be to be able to put in, for example, um, uh, various uh, meteorological data or climate data, inflow data, outflow data, um, to be able to um, drive the models. So if we can start to work towards data assimilation to automate some of this process, it's going to make a big difference to our capabilities in this area. And that means not just um, to be able to feed in the data, but also to do the quality assurance, the quality control that's required to make sure the data are valid and, and robust. Um, next slide. So when we think about <clears throat> um, the application of some of these very intensive uh, numerical models, I've just highlighted uh, some of the SEQ water dams and reservoirs throughout Southeast Queensland. And um, those are in the blue dots, and then some of those that have been modeled. And so you'll see that the numbers that have been modeled are just a small subset of the actual number of dams. And, and that really relates to the fact um, that these models, the numerical models that have been used are pretty data intensive um, and there's also no guarantee that they're going to be picked up and maintained uh, in perpetuity, which is really what we want. We want to put an investment into these models. We want to be able to use them into the future for, for freshwater management. And so um, just having uh, little specks on the landscape, it's not really what we want in comparison to being able to spread um, that expertise more widely um, over uh, sort of multiple catchments, 
multiple dams and reservoirs and um, in, in riverine system, the riverine network uh, across wide areas. So these are some of the emerging opportunities is that if we can automate and bring in the data assimilation, that's one of the benefits of these models. And the other one is around emerging opportunities for model calibration. And, and for me, I've spent many months and probably getting up towards a, a year or two, I was sitting in front of computers um, doing, trying to do fairly tedious calibration of these models. Now, if we could um, resolve some of that problem with, for example, being able to use AI to harvest information on what are the sort of parameter ranges that we might expect, um, to limit those parameter ranges and then to automate the actual calibration process, then we'd be a long way ahead. And that's not to say that we just use it inadvertently or, or unscrupulously. It is to say that um, with good user knowledge, we can sit above some of the tedium of the calibration process and be able to actually use, use um, the machine learning in, in an effective way to, um, to work to increase the number of sites that we might be um, looking at across the landscape. Next slide. Um, some of what we've been doing, and, and remember this is the sort of year-long consultation, um, and this relates to uh, some of the, the feedback that we've been, been getting. So the National Water Initiative has not effectively embedded the, the water interests of First Nations Australians. And so um, the recommendation that was made in the National Water um, Inquiry of 2024 um, or the National Water Initiative Inquiry, I should say, is the incorporation of First Nations people's interests directly into the governance of the agreement um, is what's really desired for effective uh, governance arrangements. So um, almost unanimously across the country, there is recognition and acknowledgement that we haven't worked effectively, um, as effectively as what we could have, to be able to incorporate those the, the knowledge and interests of, of First Peoples. Next slide. Just before we do, David, like mm. in terms of that, do we actually have that sort of knowledge embedded in something digital that AI can even reference to? Um, and, and that's exactly what I'm going to be talking about, Richard, in the next slide, uh, okay. which is... Um, now, this is not a one-way process. This is not us taking traditional knowledge. It's about actually using some of the AI and machine learning um, in multiple different ways to be able to effectively democratise and put a foot at the table for many of the, the interested parties, community groups, uh, traditional owners, um, others with who may have different interests, but for various reasons, whether that be the technical expertise or um, some of the, the highly scattered and uh, information, um, may not be able to get an effective foot at the table or in, in terms of um, being able to be part of strategic groups, um, advisory groups, those types of, of, of different opportunities to be able to um, influence the way that water is managed and, and the policy setting. So um, what we've had a look at is, is those opportunities to be able to provide information to these groups. And in many cases, as an example, remote sensing is a case in point um, where if you're able to open up and provide that information, it can be of enormous interest and benefit to, um, to all groups but very often the people that are most connected, intimately connected um, with their, their catchments. The caveat in all of this, of course, is that responsible AI, um, and it's called responsible AI, it is a term, is critical for First Nations cultural and intellectual property protection, and, and of course, any other sensitive information. So we've got to be absolutely certain here that um, the information that 
for most AI systems is just simply harvested and not necessarily attributed to the people can be and and, and um, due acknowledgement and, and recognition is given to, to all parties who contribute that information. Um, I, I'm just putting an example here on the right hand side and that relates to um, the different submissions. So that in the case of the Great Barrier Reef, um, it was around uh, a Senate inquiry into practices uh, ensuring evidence-based regulation of farm practices that have water quality um, impacts on the Great Barrier Reef. So there were 120 submissions here. And what Ajmal was able to do um, was, was use a well-directed inquiry into chat GPT to be able to summarize uh, a lot of that information quite succinctly into sort of four or five pages instead of being actually a hundred, hundreds and uh, over a thousand pages of, of information. And so uh, again, it has to be a well-informed inquiry, um, but extremely valuable because not everybody is of course gonna go and, and read e every one of those thousand or more pages. And so in this particular case, it was summarized into groups making the submissions. Um, it was able to draw perspectives and information about the content um, of different agencies and, and um, build up, in essence, an, an inventory of, of the information base that was contributed to that inquiry. From my perspective, extremely valuable to be able to get that information and draw together those, um, those different submissions. But it, it does extend more widely than that, and it can be um, grey report, reports in the grey literature, can be published papers, it can be um, different information sources that may then be used to sort of build information specific to um, a particular group, and whether that's storylines or reports that may be specific to them. Um, next slide. Uh, we often hear about uh, long-term monitoring programs and the costs that are involved with those long-term monitoring programs. Should they be maintained? What's the justification for them? Um, and how do they compare with uh, sort of one-off type sampling events uh, to, to capture the state of the system, for example? So part of the idea here is to use machine learning to establish relationships of some of those dependent variables, something that may be of interest to us, and many of the independent variables. Um, so it may be weather conditions, could be the, um, the discharge, uh, it may be certain water quality drivers um, that all affect um, a variable of interest. Now, um, with the AI, um, what we're able to do is to be able to build up a cause and effect type um, relationship. So using um, five, 10, perhaps 100 different variables that actually drive the variable of interest and be able to prioritize which are most important. So what this has the potential to do is to enable us to consider, do we need to still keep on monitoring certain variables. Uh, what is the value of these long-term versus short-term monitoring programs? And also, if we're putting sensors and going to have to maintain and um, analyze the data of sensors, then we are going to have to be quite adept at um, considering, are they value for money? And these are the questions, of course, that managers are often asking. And, and I think that um, AI and, and Ashmar will probably allude to um, soon. Next slide. So this is the last of the slides before I hand over to Ashmar, um, but it's, it's about how can we use some of the learnings from perhaps intensively monitored catchments? Um, and we may have a variety of different sensors in, in, in that catchment. Uh, we may be interfacing with some of the conventional monitoring programs um, going out monthly or something like that, um, going out and monitoring flood events. And, and how do we take that information from a data intensive catchment to a data poor catchment? 
The data poor catchment, of course, may have, for example, people who are very passionate about that particular environment, whether that's local communities, traditional owners, or others um, that really want to be able to build a case for uh, the, the, the importance and um, the need for, in some cases, protection, or the need for um, uh, uh, an integrated assessment in those catchments. So what we've been considering is how we interface between some of the science-based um, information that becomes accessible, some of the um, economic information that's also really critical in the decision-making process. Uh, and um, in some cases, it, it extends into um, human health and, and other aspects of well-being that are really important in terms of the quality of the environment that, that is there. So for these types of cases, it's about, um, it's about that integration and harmonization of information that can be um, greatly assisted by um, automation and using AI and machine learning. So I'll, on, on this slide, I'll hand on over to Ashmal for now. Uh, thank you, David. So uh, can we go to the previous slide, Richard? So I would like to talk uh, to the previous slide before I move on. Okay, so uh, to start, first I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which uh, UWA is located, and, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. So David has already touched upon a lot of things that AI is able to do in terms of uh, water catchment management and decision making. I'll further add to that and I'll try to make uh, the language of AI as much uh, understandable to the general public as possible. But feel free to ask specific questions if I if I fail at certain places. So in terms of uh, data, you know, when, when there's a data deluge, when you have a lot of data, uh, the conventional modeling techniques struggle, but that is a situation where exactly AI models thrive. You know, when someone says we have too much data, AI opens the door. But if someone says too much data, you know, that's where exactly AI models are good at working. And the input variables uh, they can be of the order of millions. You know, not not hundreds. You could have millions of input variables and while domain knowledge is important and is integrated into the system, but to start with, we don't have to uh, handpick data. AI is automatically able to take every variable that you throw at uh, the AI model and train a, a model that will give you predictions and only use the ones that are relevant. And not only so, it will also tell you which ones are more relevant for this particular uh, prediction compared to the others. So it's, it's, it's able to process uh, data for completely different sources. For example, here you can see we have agrodynamics, we have uh, biological data, we have remote sensing data, we have weather data, we have perhaps uh, you know, wind direction, uh, water levels and so on. That's my, not my domain where I try to uh, emphasize that we could have completely different types of data. Some of them could be like in the form of tables. Some of them could be in the form of uh, uh, images. Some of them could be in the form of 3D uh, you know, like volumes. Uh, some of them can even be categorical data. And now with the power of large language models, some of that could be traditional knowledge that, uh, for example, the uh, First Nations knowledge. So we can all integrate that and without having to explicitly design as conventionally done, uh, let the AI model decide you know, how to integrate all this data to decide a certain outcome. So the best situation that we have for training an AI model is that when we have a lot of data, heterogeneous or homogeneous, and some sort of labels for that data. So that's the easiest situation for AI and AI thrives in that the first AI algorithms actually uh, kind of became famous because there was a big data set that was made where annotation was available for every uh, sample. But this is not the case all the time. Sometimes you have data, but you don't 
have annotations for all of the data. You can annotate some of the data only because annotation takes time, uh, laboratory uh, testing takes time, uh, human expert annotations, they, they, they take time. So in, in, in that case, the AI models, they learn in a self-supervised way. That is called self-supervised learning. And that is exactly when, when AI models started to learn in a self-supervised way, that's when it became very famous. You know, that's when you everybody started uh, incorporating AI. Everybody started talking about AI. That's exactly how ChatGPT has been trained. It's trained in a self-supervised way. It just looks at text on the web, tries to predict the next text, and that's how it learns. And then that's how it's able to answer all your questions. And of course, it hallucinates at some time. So in this particular case of water catchments, we can take all these heterogeneous data and we can make the AI model learn in a self-supervised way, correlating different types of data. It might correlate uh, hydrodynamics with imaging data or molecular data with uh, something else and, and learn uh, in a, super, a self supervised way. It can also, uh, if we have lots of historic data, which I believe is available, it, you can let the model learn how to predict the next data. You know, so, so data that sequentially comes, you let it predict the next data that should be there, which you already have to adjust the model if it makes an error in the prediction. And that is exactly how ChatGPT has been trained. Now, when you train the models in, in a self-supervised way for predicting something that is sort of uh, uh, artificially uh, generated or, or different type of data sets, that kind of analysis may not necessarily be valuable for a downstream task. In that case, you throw a little bit of annotated data, which is easy to produce which is with, with, with the help of domain experts. And now the AI model transfers to that. And it, it can, with, it doesn't, because it doesn't need that much training data and can learn how to make those predictions much easily. So another really powerful aspect of uh, AI models is that they can be transferred from one domain to another domain. Or for example, in water catchments from a catchment that is data rich to a catchment that is data sparse. So perhaps this other uh, uh, catchment has not been as much uh, 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 analyzed. There are not as many buoys. There are not any sensors. It ha hasn't been sampled so frequently. But you can train a model where uh, from a catchment which has rich data and then transfer that and First of all, that model will tell you which of the input variables were the most valuable for making your predictions. And which, and that will then correlate in turn to the sensors. And so, so we would know in terms of priority that these sensors in a ranked list play the most important role in doing the analysis. So, so you could do a cost-effective way of deployment of those sensors. Secondly, it can also tell you how frequently you need to do the measurements. For example, if some pattern is low frequency, you don't need to measure it too many times. You could use the Tyco sampling rate. So it will tell you how to optimize your measurements in terms of frequency. It will tell you how to optimize your measurements in terms of spatial placement over the uh, uh, or the water catchment. You know, like uh, how many buoys do you need? Uh, at how many points do you need to sample the water? And of course, it will tell you what type of sensors are the most important to deploy first. Now, I don't have examples from the catchment uh, domain, but I'll give you an example of uh, city scale planning and uh, analysis from the context of self-driving car, because I believe that a lot of people can kind of can relate to self-driving cars. They read about them, they hear the stories, uh, even these tiny self-driving buses that people might have tried out. So can you please go to the next slide? So here, this is a video where, where we show how we can scan uh, a whole city and make a single model out of that. So essentially, we can do exactly the same uh, for a water catchment. So this is a video. Uh, Richard, can you play? Uh, you know, okay. Yeah. Find out uh, Yeah, the play button. Now, you see that round spot? That is the blind spot around the vehicle. And you, you, you can see that we are capturing all the trees. They're also capturing all the light poles, which are so thin. You, uh, at some stages, you'll see the pedestrians as well crossing the roads. 
so this is we're driving to uh, Perth CBD. This is Barrack Street. If if you've ever visited Perth, you you recognize some of these street names. This is Hay Street. So we're driving and we're capturing this data at 25 frames per second. And this data is the form of uh, is 3D data where every point is X Y Z location. So you can basically register that, and you can keep registering that to to kind of make a whole map. Now here we show a top view where we are traveling along these dots. The street names are also written and we're registering the data <laughs> to the previous frame, to the previous frame, and we, we map we map the whole city in, in, in the form of uh, uh, using loops so that our errors don't accumulate. So after that, you know, we expect the loop to meet a certain known point so that does the self-error correction. And with this technique, we can generate a whole map of the city. This could be a catchment. This could be anything. AI doesn't care what the data uh, relates to. It treats every data as the same. So you now I show the city, 3D city map on the left and on the right, a Google map. You can see that all the streets perfectly resemble the 3D uh, city location. And here's a flyover through, uh, through that map. This could well be uh, the vegetation around a, a catchment uh, or, 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 or a river or a dam or anything. So that video is over. Let's go to the next slide. So I'll here explain one example of uh, self-supervised learning. Now we're capturing data at such a high rate, you know, 20 or 25 frames per second. How do we label a frame? You know, I mean, we can't label frame by frame. So we, ha we have to devise some automatic way of training an AI model. This is a complicated AI model that was designed by my students from scratch. So, so we don't borrow models and train them. We design custom models for uh, the specific purpose. And to train them, in this particular case, because our sensor does a 360 degree scan, we divide the 360 degrees into four quadrants and then we shuffle them. Because we shuffle them ourselves, we know how to unshuffle and that, uh, and we, we train the model to learn how to unshuffle the scans. Now, the model learns how to unshuffle the scans, which seems like a fairly useless task. Why would we want to unshuffle this? But to be able to unshuffle the scans, which is a pretext task, the model learns structure in those scans. And once it learns structures only, then it is able to un unshuffle the, plan, uh, the, the, the scans. Now, this model, we can throw at it infinite amount of data, you know, imagine 25 frames per second driving uh, for a few hours per day for, let's say, 30 days, that this is more than enough to train this model. Once it is trained to unshuffle the, scan, uh, the quadrants, uh, it has learned how to encode the structure in these scans. So if you go to the next slide, now we take this model and we put it here, you know, the green box, that is the model that we trained in the previous slide. We put it here and then we put a few more uh, layers to it uh, at extended uh, uh, model. And then we mark some of these scans to identify the location where the car was. And now fine tune this model or transfer this model. Now this model is able to, uh, to tell us or it first is learns from our small annotated data, and then it tells us exactly where in the city it is if we throw at it a new scan. Not just the location, but also the exact orientation, 3D orientation. So if you had a sort of a uh, sideways uh, or a, an inclined road, it will be able to tell us that. So this is called self-supervised learning. After self-supervised learning, you can fine tune a model, you can transfer it to another case. We could have, actually, we also did that. We we fine tune this model to be able to recognize object, object categories. We can fine tune this model to do any other downstream task, but in this particular case, we were doing localization of the car and the, at the end, the T corresponds to the translation within the map, the R corresponds to the rotation in the map. So that's three plus three, six uh, values that we are predicting over here. This was published in the top uh, venue of uh, robotics that is ranked number one by Google Scholar. Go to the next slide. 
So here we extend our model to be able to handle heterogeneous data, just like in catchments. In catchments, you have different types of data. You know, some might be tabular data, some might be uh, remote sensing data, some might be captured on ground. So we have three types of input data here. One is the LiDAR data. That was the one that I showed the video for, the 360 degree scans. The other one is camera, just like your dash cams. You know, so that's, that's the general camera data. And then the third one is radar data. Uh, radars are kind of those uh, sensors that you have when you're reversing a car, but they don't show you the image. Radar data is a little bit more sparse, so it's based on radio waves. LiDAR data, which gives you the 3D scan, is based on lasers, and camera is just uh, a passive reflected uh, light. And we have multiple of them. You know, like For example, we have left and right LiDAR. We have left, rear, uh, or right three cameras, and then we have one radar. And our model here, you can just ignore the complexities. Again, a custom designed model. Uh, the model learns how to predict the location of the car from one or more of these inputs. You can throw one input at it, two inputs at it, or all three inputs at it. And there is a switch, which is also a learnable switch. You know? So you don't have to tell it, you know, which data is more reliable than the other. It is already learned on the fly and makes that decision, not like statically that LiDAR data is always better, but on the fly that this LiDAR doesn't sound, look good data, this radar is more accurate in this particular case and will give you the prediction of the location of, uh, of that car. We could have well correlated uh, camera with uh, LiDAR or radar and because this work is a little bit old, you know, in 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 uh, this was also pu published in sort of the second ranked uh, conference of uh, robotics in 2023. But now in 2024, one year is like one century in terms of AI developments. So things have moved. If you are going to uh, develop this car again, we would have a language model going somewhere, some information as to the driving rules and. Uh, uh, some 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 literature on driving as to what you might see at an intersection or a cross section that would be aiding the car to further localize it better. Uh, and, and to add to uh, some of the discussion that David did on the 120 submissions to the uh, water related uh, stuff, uh, I ran through that through uh, chat GPT, but also through two other models. So we, ChatGPT is not the only model that is available. There are, I stopped counting after I counted 30. So, and that was a while ago, so there might be more. And they are available freely and they're open source. ChatGPT is not open source. You can use ChatGPT, but you can't tune, uh, fine tune ChatGPT uh, to your purpose. So these are other 30 plus models that are available, which we can, deploy multiple of them and fine tune them ourselves to, to be able to guide the research. So, so you'll have this model that gives you the prediction, but also kind of could also tell you how this incorporates traditional knowledge into that. Or if a decision that you might be making can contradict or can possibly be not acceptable given uh, the uh, First Nation uh, owners of the land. So, so it can it, 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 it can do all that sort of uh, analysis, and it can also incorporate the uh, the literature, the catchment science related literature into these models, so that they can make better prediction and that they can make uh, better analysis of the data, and they can actually tell you exactly why and how they reached to a certain conclusion. So I think this is this should be my last slide. I'll hand this back over to David. And yeah, so I'll wait for your questions at the end. Thanks, Ashmal. Um, so really, this was just a brief summary. And, and it's a summary of, of sort of, as much as anything, stakeholder needs over, over um, in piecing together information over the past year or so. Reducing the data churn is really important. Um, effectively using investments in remote sensing technology, whether they be um, from drones or from, from satellites. Um, near real-time information is really critical. Um, can help a lot with management, uh, preparation for flooding, 
various regulatory purposes. Being able to extrapolate and extend some of the modeling to a landscape scale approach and not just to sort of individual water bodies, which requires an awful lot of time in many cases to be able to get up and, and running for, the, for those models. Evaluating um, monitoring programs uh, is, is, is another. Uh, we don't want to lose good long-term programs or um, and, and especially where they give us long-term tracking of state and trends, but we do have to be sufficiently receptive to um, potentially what AI can tell us about um, the, the value of those programs and whether or not certain variables are relevant. And the, the last one, um, being able to look at the many independent variables, potentially hundreds, that might affect a, a dependent variable. And, and that's obviously going to be important and links back to the monitoring program as well. And, and the final one, which Ajmal uh, talked to quite extensively, was this data transfer knowledge going from data rich to data poor catchments. Um, and the last slide there. Um, so we're putting together part of the team, as I mentioned um, earlier, putting together uh, an ARC center of excellence for, called Transforming Water Catchments. And really that's about accelerating the impact of, of current investments in, in the area. Um, as we know, there's a lot of um, effort going into resilient rivers, um, into the Great Barrier Reef and various other um, programs, especially around the, the nature repair market. And um, what we want to be able to do is provide the validity and value for money to optimize those investments. So thanks, Richard, and happy to take questions. And I'm sure they'll probably be mostly for Asma on the AI side. Uh, in a minute, David. <laughs> yeah, looking, I'm looking at the questions, you know, and um, they are, that's why I was getting my sugar level high just before the meeting, you know, if you remember. <laughs> All right, uh, well, let's start with the first question. Real-time profiles into understanding catchment inputs and management and cultural values into thinking. <clears throat> David or Ashma? Oh, sorry, uh, which question is this? Is this from Claudia? The uh, uh, early bird, we start with the early bird question. Yeah. So that's, that's at 11.02 a.m. When incorporating diverse variables and data sets into machine learning models to enhance predictive... No, no, no. no, no just no, what's no. on the screen there, Ashma. Oh, uh, okay, okay, okay. So... Uh, uh, I was going to the chat thing. Okay, so I, wasn't, I wasn't exactly clear what what the question was in this first one. It, it's is it about can we can we bring in real time profiles into? I think they're looking at is it going to get easier to bring real time profiles into understanding catchment inputs? And, um, and that, that is totally what we're but, I think um, we've pretty we're, much we're, covered that. Yeah. We're about yeah yeah very very much um, and here I, I I would use the word that might be used wrongly or rightly here but data harmonisation um, how do you pull together these disparate sources and, and look for for common um, patterns common themes uh, things that are not easily able to be done by the human the single human mind um, but. Um, looking for that type of recognition, but I'll hand, hand to Ashmal uh, anyway. All uh, right, I think the first one kind of says that can we do this in real time? Yes, that's that's the whole aim. You know, AI models. You know, first they they scrutinize the data. They uh, they uh, will pick up the most uh, relevant variables, and at the end you'll have an efficient model that will integrate all these uh, uh, inputs and 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 give you a sort of a uh, combined uh, prediction, combined uh, output uh, in real time. And another uh, beauty about, you know, how ChatGPT is answering so many questions, you know, at the same time. So you can think, you can see how, how the capability is because they're based on GPUs. GPUs are getting faster and faster. Going to the second question, can AI predict and provide advice on specific actions to prevent large fish kills in Murray Darling? When you can potentially ask AI 
specific questions like this based on those models, but how it, will, it is going to do is that AI will find out what actually changed, you know, when the fish were healthy to when the fish started dying. So anomaly detection, you know, so you don't specifically, uh, if you don't even throw a specific question at the AI, uh, it, you can just look for anomalies, you know, where were the anomalies happening? And anomalies might be happening at different scales, you know, tiny anomalies, and then you get these spikes, and then you might be able to relate that. And so the short answer is yes, at the least, it will be able to narrow down uh, the causes, and it might need some more data to exactly pinpoint point. Or if 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 there were enough data initially, and if the uh, the uh, uh, and the death of fish were uh, 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 very specific to one uh, event that can be isolated, AI will give you the answer. AI will give you the answer right away. So how can AI help in decision making? Well, first of all. You know the, the plethora of uh, sorry uh, uh, input variables that there are. So your it it helps in better decision making. So you, at the moment decision decisions are made, but they are made on these classical models, which first of all are not even taking the whole data into account. But secondly, they're 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 kind of also isolated, so they're not looking at the um, uh, sort of let's say the continent level. So a lot of these events could be uh, related. So so AI will be able to present the data in a better way. Just, just, just. Uh, uh, Ishmael, most important. On that, sorry yeah. to interrupt, but it seems to me there's a premise that the more different types of data you throw at it, the more clarity you're going to get out of it, and because AI has got the capability to process all this data, we're going to get greater clarity but in a physical setting um you could spend a <laughs> you could go down a whole bunch of rabbit warrens if you physically understand a system right like a catchment and you know that you know from direct observations and hydrogeology say that there's interactions wouldn't you be better off to be limiting that data like is not less better than more like could oh, yeah. ai not get confused and come up with all sorts of correlations which are actually coincidence uh well the first thing is that ai will help you identify those kind of coincidences and cor correlations and the second part is that the ai is never or should never be deployed in isolation. It will always be deployed in conjunction with domain expert knowledge. And this is what we call physics-inspired AI models. So they have these physics in them. And they, the, the physics, the, the, the domain knowledge would, would be involved in the design of the AI models so that when they are training, they don't learn something that is known to be impossible or they don't kind of correlate variables that are known to be independent, you know, or after a bit of analysis that you said, okay, this tiny bit of correlation that we find in these two data is just, uh, you know, maybe maybe by chance, maybe there's some 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 noise in there that is getting correlated. You know, sometimes in, in images you have this tiny logo at one corner, and the AI model learns uh, to uh, that if this logo is there, this image is this, you know, which is not correct. That's where the domain knowledge comes in to, to guide the AI model. So the way it will help you is, uh, the decision making is that it will narrow down and tell which data is more important. Secondly, it will better visualize the data for you. It will learn projections that kind of separate certain aspects of the data and present it to you visually. The third is it will give you uh, um, uh, predictions, you know, that if you change this at the input, this might change at the output. So we're not talking about AI working in isolation. We're talking about AI working with domain experts at the design stage and also at the decision stage. It's going to be an interesting moment, though, where you've got human nature being what it is and AI producing fairly compelling 
um, correlations, shall we say, or patterns, that where do you introduce that uh, that sort of application knowledge? You know, when when is the best time to do that? Is it at the beginning to restrict what AI looks at or is it at the end after it's come up with all these patterns? So I, I think at both stages, you know, at, mm. at the beginning, you know, we, we want to restrict the AI models based on domain knowledge, you know, put a physics into the model. You saw that complicated architecture that we showed. The design work based on our domain knowledge of driving cars or, you know, us humans differentiating that this is a tree, this is a pole, this is a human. And that's why we take examples we don't, where we don't need like uh, experts in chemistry or uh, hydrology, you know, so we take examples where, you know, we don't need any more expertise than AI. Uh, so it will be at both stages, yeah. Okay. Question number four, what transition time frame do you envisage given the issues of data security and reliability? David, do you want to answer that? Uh, well, <laughs> could, it's, you know, you're asking me to sort of project, project that. One thing I think we need to be careful of though is that, that if, if we use it unscrupulously or, or without validating um, the, the sort of outputs, so we're still going to have to have, to have expert knowledge, then things could go badly wrong and, and, and people would lose confidence, they'd lose trust in it. Um, and and so, so the staging of it needs to be really, is, is really critical. Um, it's why we're, we're advocating for this responsible AI um, and and without that, I think that you know it, it, it will be harvesting information that may be sensitive that that may be resting with traditional owners um, that that should not be put out into the public domain. So we've got a lot of lot to work through in actual fact. And, and the other part is, is that it needs to be guided by people who are able to write to, to, to address the right questions and, and are, are able to, to pick up, well, where does it fall down? So there's a whole catchment science part here that is, is around the validity of it. Um, and, um, you know, if, if we're going to start using AI, and I'm sure we will, in sort of nature repair markets and, and, and that sort of thing, then you want to make sure that if the data are secure, that the data are trustworthy, and um, that they're not going to be used by other parties in ways that aren't intended. So, so lots to work through here, um, for sure. But if it's if it's a well staged process um, with with the right measures put in place, then I think it it, it offers an incredible. Um, opportunity. Yeah, so to add to that, we will have data security and model reliability embedded in the design of the AI models. We're not going to design AI models and then think about data security and reliability. This is going to be embedded at the design stage. So if we look at um the current way we collect environmental data and the errors that are just incumbent with the way different parties collect it, like a lot of people don't follow the same standards. Is there a way for AI to tell us whether or not those errors are significant? Like, and I guess... I'm just getting to the data provenance piece. So, you know, everyone talks about if you have bad data in, you're going to get bad outcomes. But we've already said there's more data than everyone can keep up with. So is AI going to be able to help us screen out poor data based on, or are we going to have to quality code all data that goes into it for it to be able to actually help us there? 
Uh, I'm going to jump in quickly and then hand over to Ashmal, but I, I just wanted to say that ability to learn is key here, and it's what makes a difference between a standard QA, QC interface um, and, and what, what's possible. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yes, um, definitely. AI model during the training time can identify samples that are not fitting into the model. And they're the basically outliers. And then the, the domain experts can then be consulted, you know, is this like a different event or is this just bad data capture? Okay. Question number five. Can AI tell us how many monitoring locations we need and where they need to be? Uh, I think we mentioned that when we had that slide about going from data rich to data poor uh, regions. Yes, definitely AI through its uh, explainability will tell us as to which variables are uh, more important and how, how frequently they should be captured. Uh, and different input variables would correspond to uh, uh, dif uh, different variables that go inside the AI model. And if it's if it says that you know these are not important, or or we could you know I mean the an easy easy example is that we can sort of do excluding the variables and train the model and it will tell us. But that's a naive approach. AI can do a much better way of uh, telling us where the locations should be. But one of the common techniques uh, that became really popular and is, is really simple is uh, masked autoencoder where some data is masked and the AI model learns how to complete that data. And that exactly tells you like, how much data is redundant. So you can keep going on and masking and see if the AI model can still predict that data. So yes, the quick answer is yes. The AI model can tell you exactly how many monitoring locations uh, you require and where they should be placed. I think we've answered number six previously. Question seven, does AI approach to catchment management supersede our physically based numerical modeling approaches? And, and well, I would, oh, oh, yeah, David. Oh, and and I, I would say here, it, it, we shouldn't be saying supersede, we should be saying complementary approaches. Yeah. Complementary in, in terms of uh, ability to use it alongside other Bayesian approaches, numerical modeling, AI, and machine learning tools, but also that capability of the machine learning to, to involve data assimilation is just a potential game changer for those models. So AI models work in collaboration with these existing models. They can work in, on top of these models. You know, so there are various configurations that, but these models, they have domain knowledge in them. And that is very variable, uh, valuable. Uh, that is valuable at the design stage. And that is also very valuable at the prediction stage. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? We sort of, one end we've got trying to predict things with mathematics. And then at the other end, we've got AI, which is sort of using mathematics, but also combining the domain element to it. That's, be interesting to see how they compare, I guess. Yeah. An interesting aspect is that you can have an AI replica of any existing numerical model that they theoretically proven that AI is able to replicate any model. But that replication is a second step. I mean, the fact that this AI model exists is because the numerical model existed. So the numerical models are not going to lose their value AI yeah, is just the new, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, complementing uh, factor. All right, we're now over to the Q and A side of things. We've got nine questions to go. If our if our panelists are happy to keep going, we will charge through these. Um, Claudia. Pelazaro, when incorporating diverse variables and data sets into machine learning models to enhance predictive accuracy and generalization, 
how can one effectively distinguish between high predictability and true explainability of the model's results? I, I think there are separate issues, you know, like so predictability with, comes with some sort of confidence uh, as output from the AI model. And then explainability is that you kind of back propagate through the model to see uh, which variables kind of contributed to this uh, prediction. So, so I think they are already separate. Well, or maybe I didn't understand the question correctly. Now we can move on to the next one. If Claudia has a follow-on question, because because I think they are already separate issues. You know, like pred prediction and explainability. Okay, hope that's an answer that Claudia is happy with. Dinesh Nadaraja, I hope I got that right. Is there an AI model to predict algal blooms in small wetlands in a local council considering climate change transition to lower rainfall and longer droughts and higher temperatures? Well, an AI model doesn't exist, but an AI model can be trained if that data is available and will be predict. That's exactly what why we need the center of excellence. Yeah, so I suppose it comes down to do they have sufficient data? Yeah. Uh, or do they have sufficient data from anywhere where we can train a model and then transfer it, it to another place where we don't where where, where they only have uh, less data. So speaking as a business that's all about measurement, do you think there's going to be a need for more measurement or less as this AI rolls out? Uh, it will, uh, well, if I understood correctly from uh, David's explanation, data is already captured at a rate that is kind of getting out of control. It's not being used fully. So AI is definitely going to reduce that. Uh, you know, and bring it more in control. It could, it will tell us what to measure, and then, uh, you know, what is all redundant. All right, <laughs> we will see what happens. Uh, next question, Abel Mirage: Is the scanner at ground level in a road vehicle or elevated, as in a drone? Uh, the one, you. yeah. It was at the ground level. It was uh, mounted on a car for the data that I showed. Is there an AI model to provide optimized urban tree planting plan to abate urban heat effect at minimum cost? We can design one. In fact, the data that I uh, or my team captured in Perth City, we were able to, uh, after some annotation, we were able to identify exactly the number of trees that occurred during our drive. And then we were able to tell that, you know, that tree was the most frequently occurring object in our data. Light pole was the second most frequent object and that the maximum area covered was by buildings, followed by a road and then buses, even though the buses were less frequent. All right, next question, Claudia. Pelazaro, are there any specific techniques or methods used to identify hallucinations in LLM generated outputs? This is an ongoing research area. We have actually submitted a paper to a top conference with a data set that is meant to find out hallucinations in LLMs. So our data set has specific questions on which AI models are, or these LLMs are uh, most commonly hallucinate, and then we catch them, and then we evaluate, okay, this is how much uh, hallucination we have in this model. One could possibly uh, correct the model, retrain it, adjust it, and then measure the hallucination again, see if it is reducing or not. But uh, whether we'll be able to remove hallucination 100%, that uh, is controversial. We'll see how things roll out, but we can definitely measure it and reduce it. So just for uh, someone who doesn't quite understand that question, um, when you say the model hallucinates, it's convinced of a pattern that 
isn't there, is that what it's? Uh, it... Hallucination is a term used for uh, LLMs uh, more frequently. Uh, and an example of that is that you ask it a question, like for example, who won the high jump in Olympics, this, 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 right? It might give you a completely wrong answer with such high confidence, you know, giving you the uh, nationality of the person and, you know, some specific uh, height that the person jumped. Whereas if you Google uh, or go on some other records, you know, that, that may never exist. So yes, LLMs hallucinate, they say things with high confidence, even though they're completely wrong. Do you think AI is overly confident? Uh, at the output of AI models, there is, there is a value that comes out, which people kind of say that in technical papers, this is confidence, which is incorrect. That confidence is a completely different thing. And if you really measure that, you can find out uh, the correct confidence value of a certain output. And if you use those correct measurements of confidence, then one would say AI is not overly confident. But if you use the you know the raw value of the output that comes out, it might label a bust as an ostrich with 99% accuracy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. If you put 1% really noise, if you put 1% noise in an image, it will label a bust as an ostrich. I think that's going to be incredibly powerful, the fact that it can also list its uncertainty. Uh, yeah, there, there are techniques to find uh, uncertainties in, in AI models. Um, next question is from Richard Savage. How are the differences in operating error in the many different data sets referenced by the AI models? And is there a process evaluating data on the basis of its accuracy? Well, you can make probabilistic models, you know, which will model the uncertainty in the data. Uh, and uncertainty in the data uh, can be uh, measured through repeated measurements, and you can model that as well in AI to give you an uncertainty value at the output as well. So the more uncertain you are about the data, the more uncertain your output will be and uh, there might be ways of using like multiple inputs to reduce that uncertainty it's going to be really interesting when we get to a point where we're really using this to sort of make big uh, investment decisions and we've got sitting next to that this calculated uncertainty to underpin that investment like instead of someone just shouting louder in a meeting, we'll actually have a more considered output from AI. But that's just me pondering the world, sorry. Uh, Richard, I think that's a really good point because it, it's almost like another objective person sitting in, in the room around the decision-making table. Um, and, and so it shouldn't be, you know, it's, its weight is not, it shouldn't be relied on to be complete but it can provide, in effect, another voice that, that is, is intended to be purely objective in, its, in, in what it gives. Yeah. It might become the loudest voice in the room because <laughs> it uh, allows everyone else to hide. <laughs> but, um, let's move on. Um, anonymous attendee. The benefits are undeniable and enormous. Do you have any concerns or is there any research you're aware of regarding the potential risks and pitfalls of being able to process query model data using these tools? Well, AI should be used with some knowledge, you know. AI should not be used without any domain knowledge. There are definitely risks. You know, like just like with this hallucination, with uh, if we have no other means of verifying uh, what uh, the output of an AI, uh, then there's definitely a risk 
But if you have means of verifying, you know, and once in a while, if AI tells us some, for example, there is something happening, you know, some big algae booming event or some high temperature change in, in a catchment or, or something else, you know, something that is huge, then we should have the domain experts to verify that. So AI is not Skynet that is going to, you know, you're not never gonna give it that much ability to take a decision and that's it, you know, will depend upon the magnitude of uh, the decision to sort of get that. It will tell us the, the reasons, you know, with explainable AI as, we, you know, the, the AI model is giving this output because of this, this reasons, and those reasons could be verified if, uh, if it is something that is unexpected or something that is huge. Mm. Next question, Zhu Yen Wong. How much investment does it need to get a first version working AI system for this off the ground? Five full-time AI engineers for a year, 10 PhD theses? Let's... I think it just needs one center of excellence. <laughs> Did you write that question? <laughs> and so... <laughs> Uh, all right, I think uh, we've got the answer there. One center of excellence. Next question from another anonymous attendee. Add on to risk question. Can you flip the benefits into risks? Therefore, risk of producing a larger churn. Exponential increase in AI outputs to consider and validate against empirical observations. Or is this the answer to that? more or is the answer to that more ai it's a good question uh well no i mean ai takes a lot of data as input and produces a very small output for example in let's say image classification it takes like a million pixels and give one output so how can ai generate more data than 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 there was already there so the AI always goes like a funnel, you know, more input, and it, you know, the output is always less. You can have something on top of that AI if, if, if you have too many AI models, you know, like say, if you have like say 50 catchments around Australia producing some output, you can have AI looking at all of them together and squeezing the 50 outputs to one output. I think it'll go a bit differently to that. Like I think, we're suddenly going to process all this data and that's going to lead to a whole lot of questions that need the senior people to make sort of management decisions on. So the, the workload will shift, right? But in the end, we're not going to trust AI to make all the decisions. That's just my thoughts on it. Yeah, we should never trust AI to make all the decisions. We should only trust. AI is a very good, untiring uh, well-informed assistant. Yeah. Decisions should always be made by humans. So next question, Kavindi Jayawira. Can we use an AI model for road and footpath maintenance as a predictive tool without relying on proactive inspections? If so, is there an existing model available? Uh, I think there was a honors project in our uh, department. So they would uh, basically uh, drive something on top of the footpath and it will scan it and you know, at the end identify where there are kind of uh, points of maintenance. You know? So you could potentially put that for road bike or footpaths, you could put it on a bicycle or something. For roads, of course, you already saw that scanning uh, you just need to point that more to what you want to measure. Yes, so you can do. Uh, you, you can find out potentially every pothole automatically in the uh, on the road. It will automate it. It might miss a few uh, potholes, but then it will give you very fast out uh, outcome. So, is there an AI model like maybe? A foundation model for all these specific purposes is not available, but generalized AI foundation models are 
being frequently released. So rather than because, you know, you might want to do footpath assessment, road assessment, building assessment, tree assessment, data assessment, you know, light pole assessment. So rather than having an infinite set of models, what AI is doing is that making foundation models. Like there will be a one foundation model that is good at image analysis. So this image could be of a road, footpath, light pole, building, catchment, tree. And then you have transfer knowledge, you know, like the, the, what that I talked about. You transfer that knowledge for your particular application. You show it a little few uh, anomalies in a footpath. This is how anomaly in a footpath look like. And then with a little bit of data, this uh, AI model now can do this job for you. And the same goes for uh, anomalies in buildings or, uh, you know, unapproved balconies appearing in buildings or so on. Okay, next question. Jazz Singh, one limitation of remote sensing is that it retrieves surface reflectance data. Is there a way through AI to utilize a historical water column quality monitoring database to simulate an estimation of water column water quality? Uh, yes, it can. Uh, how good will it, it is going to be depends upon how well the water column data is related to the surface reflection. Surface reflections uh, can be measured through uh, hyperspectral imaging, where every pixel is measured like in, in from 200 to 300 bands. And some of these bands reflect from subsurface. You know, so for it, the, specifically the, uh, the infrared ones, uh, you know, they, they will reflect from uh, below the surface. But of course, this is a challenging problem. You want to measure something that's an underwater water column from the surface, and that too from outside of, you know, in space. So uh, AI is definitely not magic. It will give you the best result that is possible given whatever data you have. It's a good question here from Eleanor Pritchard. What are the risks of this, given the future risks of AI, therefore taking over for society as a whole? So AI is the new technology. Everybody's going to take it, uh, you know, and start using AI. If we don't use AI, we'll be left behind. AI is not going to take over humans. Humans who use AI will take over humans who do not use AI. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> Okay, that's a good answer. Claudia Pelazaro, more of an observation than a question. It struck me that the idea of one centre of excellence might go against the grain of AI's decentralised nature. David, what do you think of that? Um, look, the, the AI is... Sorry, the AI, the centre is intended really to be a catalyst uh, as much as anything. Um, it, it, it's designed to be the, the sort of coordinating, bring the, together the coordinating research that, that really brings uh, an opportunity for, for leverage on existing investments as much as anything. So, so we're certainly not saying it, it, it's the be all end all. It, it's designed to really accelerate what many people are doing in catchment management at the moment. And if we can, if we can target that, make it better informed, um, I think that that's where our, our opportunity is. Yeah. Okay. Next question, and I think we'd better make this the last one. Abel Imaraj. Hi, David and Richard. AI is already informing, influencing financial markets and trade. It diverts investment into addressing areas of known risk. This deprives investment in natural resource management. The CRC should consider the interplay of nature-related risk to the economy and financial markets. 
Um, thanks, Abel. And I, I, I could only expect a question like that coming from you, um, a really thoughtful one. And, and um, just one point of clarification, it's not a CRC, it's a Centre of Excellence. Um, and, and so this particular one is, is done through Australian Research Council. Um, and um, Centres of Excellence are, are designed to bring together key researchers and co-designed um, projects. So there, there are some, some important differences there. But to go back to your, your, your question, um, I think that's something that we need to consider really carefully because um, the, the evolving um, natural capital market is one that comes with all of the risks and potential for greenwashing and um, people seeking opportunities which may not necessarily be in the, in the long term. So um, great question, one that we'll definitely take into the, into the centre. All right. Well, thanks very much to both David and Ajmal for that fantastic webinar. Obviously, a lot of a lot more to be discussed about AI, but I think it's uh, got a compelling value proposition, that's for sure. So thank you very much to both of you and good luck with getting the Centre of Excellence going. Thanks, thank Richard. Very much. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.